This is a production of Cornell University. My name is Chuck Green, and I'm in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And today's seminar is brought to you by the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, the Shoals Marine Lab, and the Cornell Center for Sustainable Future. It's a great privilege to get to introduce um, Dr. Jim Baker to you. Um, I've known Jim for many years, as he was the chair of the Department of Oceanography, where I uh, got my graduate degree. And uh, I've watched Jim do a lot of firsts in his career. He was uh, the first and founding dean of our uh, College of Ocean and Fishery Science at the University of Washington, and subsequently went on to um, become the first and founding president of the Oceanography Society. Uh, Jim also uh, served during the Clinton administration as the chief administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, he currently is working with the Clinton Foundation's Global Carbon Measurement Program. Um, it's really a pleasure to bring Jim here because we're Ocean Sciences at Cornell is one of the best kept secrets on campus. We really have one of the best programs in the world with, with various faculty members uh, doing really top research and the Shoals Marine Laboratory, which trains more undergraduates than any other marine science program during the summertime. Uh, today's talk Jim will be giving is on oceans and climate change, impacts and opportunities, and I can think of nobody that's better prepared to give a talk on this particular topic. So with that, I'll step aside and make way for Jim. Thanks, Chuck. It's a, really a, a pleasure to be here. And in fact, I started my oceanographic career at Cornell on a day much like today. I was a graduate student in physics, and I was walking along the, the snowy path with my roommate who told me that his brother was going to go to the South Seas this summer. And I thought, yes, that sounds like a good idea. And so uh, I wrote the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and they said, uh, yeah, we have a summer program, and you should sign up for it. And I went out there and spent the summer. We didn't go to the South Seas. We just went south of San Diego. But uh, it was a lot of fun watching the oceanographers sit there and with a big globe trace out where they're going to go next year and the next year and apply science to real practical problems. And it seems like such an exciting field. I said, how do you become an oceanographer? And they said, you should finish your degree and then uh, write to us. So I, uh, I finished up. I was doing soft x-ray physics and didn't want to just continue on working my way through the periodic table. And so uh, I, I wrote to them and they said, great, we'll give you a fellowship, meet us in Singapore. So I got an air ticket and headed to Singapore and we spent the next six months going back and forth across the Indian Ocean and I was hooked on doing oceanography. And as uh, Chuck just said, I've had a number of different things that I've been in, involved with and uh, I've been very impressed with the uh, Cornell program, the work that, that Chuck does and Chris Clark who's just showing us some wonderful stuff that he has about uh, acoustics and it's a, Really, it's the first time I've been back since I graduated. I won't tell you how long ago. Uh, but it's uh, really wonderful to, to see the program. And I'm going to talk today about uh, the uh, impacts uh, and opportunities that we have as, as we look at uh, the uh, interactions of oceans and climate. Climate is affected by oceans. Oceans affect the climate. There's a lot of things that are happening right now. It's all accelerating in ways that we don't fully understand. Lots of opportunity for new understanding and new things to be done by students. So let me, uh, let me run through that and uh, finish up with a little uh, discussion about how do we communicate these, these important issues to the, to the public. Well, when we think about climate change, this is really summarizes all of the science we have, this probability distribution curve that says that if you double the amount of greenhouse gases, it's mostly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we expect to get an equilibrium uh, we expect to get a climate uh, change of somewhere between one and a half and, and four and a half degrees. If you're a climate skeptic, you're going to think that maybe the problems are down here. If you're a climate extremist, 
Maybe you're going to say that's what's going to happen, but if you're some kind of sensible person, you're going to say this is what we should expect to see, that's the highest probability, and that's really what we should plan for. And if you're a planner, if you're running the government and you want to really do these things right, you should say we're going to hope for this, we're going to be prepared for something like this, and we are going to operate as if this is going to happen. And so that's really what we have to do. We haven't been doing that in our government, but I think under the new administration, I think there's a chance for really uh, dealing with this. And hopefully, as we learn more about climate and as we go forward, this sensitivity of uh, the climate to changes in the greenhouse gases will get narrower, so we'll have a better, we can narrow the range of, of uncertainties. Well, think about some of the impacts of, uh, of the changing in, in, in the carbon dioxide. One is, one is warming, obviously, as the atmosphere warms, the ocean warms, and you get not only sea level rise, but the impacts of warming on coral reefs and so on. But also, uh, as CO2 uh, rises in the atmosphere, the ocean itself gets more acid. It doesn't really matter how much the ocean, I mean, how much the atmosphere warms. It's not a question of warming, it's just a question of the chemistry of the uh, atmosphere and the ocean. So ocean acidification is a very serious problem, something we have to deal with, and I wanted to uh, mention that. So let's, let's look at the following set of issues. Uh, we expect to get a, a more acid ocean with uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, with, with the increase in temperature, we expect to see coral bleaching. Uh, we expect to see sea level rise. Uh, we're currently overusing most of the ocean resources, the, the fisheries and, and biological resources in, in particular, and uh, all of this overuse is exacerbated by the, uh, all the climate changes that we have. The oceans are critical in forecasting climate uh, as we look beyond uh, a couple of weeks trying to make forecasts in the atmosphere. Uh, we know we have to include oceans and we have to make those measurements so that we can have accurate forecasts. Uh, the ways of dealing with climate change, a lot of them involve trying to change the way the Earth operates, we call it geoengineering. Some of this geoengineering goes into the ocean. My guess is that we're going to see some of this. What's the impact? That's another important point. Uh, there's a lot of talk about trying to sequester carbon as it comes out of uh, coal plants or industrial use and so on. And some of that discussion is sequestering carbon in the ocean. You can either pump CO2 down to the bottom. Uh, you can uh, add iron to the ocean, hoping that you can grow more plankton, add fertilizer to the ocean, and sequester carbon that way. But this, it's going to have an impact on the ecosystems, something we have to uh, worry about. Then finally, uh, I'll uh, finish up with a little discussion about this new Arctic, the new melted Arctic that we're facing as the... Uh, Arctic uh, ice melts, uh, there's a new race for resources and, and claims that, that are happening. Uh, and then uh, I think what's very important is that we communicate all these issues out to the public so people understand what's going on. We get the kind of resources we need to do to do the research, the adaptation, and the mitigation. So just a few words about uh, ocean acidification. As oceanographers, we all learned that the uh, ocean pH can't change. It's buffered. There's all these uh, systems in place that have kept the pH pretty constant. But all of that is true only if the, if the uh, rate of input of, of carbon dioxide is relatively long on geological time scales. As soon as we do it rapidly, uh, the ocean doesn't have time to buffer itself. Uh, the CO2 dissolves in seawater. You make carbonic acid. The carbonic acid is corrosive to the shells and skeletons of uh, marine organisms and to corals. And so we have this loss of, of part of the food web. We also know that uh, as the CO2 is added to the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets warm, the ocean gets warm. Uh, as the temperature, sea surface temperature rises, there is a critical point at which we start to see coral bleaching, somewhere above 29 degrees Celsius. And you can see here on the uh, graph that uh, as ocean temperature rises, we have the problem of, uh, of, of additional uh, uh, of, uh, of coral bleaching happening, and, and we can see that. Uh, another thing that happens uh, with sea level rise is that there's a bigger impact of all the uh, coastal storms. Uh, a small amount of sea level rise is translated into a much bigger coastal impact simply because of the slope 
of, of the sea floor. So the, the impact of waves that I demonstrated here, uh, storm surge, all of the, uh, the coastal impacts, even though we have a small sea level rise, we expect, we expect to see somewhere about one foot per century. But uh, you can translate that in many cases by a factor of 20 or 30 in terms of, uh, in, in terms of impact. So sea level rise is uh, something that's not just the small rise that we might see, but it's also this, uh, this tremendous coastal impact. So any, the impacts of coastal storms are, are uh, greatly uh, in, increased. Then, then uh, you probably are hearing lectures and, and discussing the, the whole question about overuse of, of the seas, the fact that we're, uh, we're not really operating sustainably with the, with the fisheries uh, that we, uh, and marine resources that we take from the ocean. It turns out that um, this is not something new. There's a recent book that just came out uh, by Callum Roberts called The Unnatural History of the Sea. Jeremy Jackson has done some interesting papers on this. Almost every time that humans have, have interacted with the ocean, they have not operated in a sustainable way, They've taken more fish than they, they should. It's a very hard thing to keep the levels down uh, to uh, sustainable levels. Uh, only a few of the fisheries that we operate uh, operate at a sustainable level because the catch is so low, you can't really uh, support that many uh, fishermen. We, we operate, for example, with a uh, uh, very sustainable take of uh, bowhead whales in the north by the Alaska Eskimos. Uh, but in fact, if we applied the same model to fisheries, most of the commercial fishermen would go out of business. So something that doesn't work, it's a huge problem. We don't know the answer yet. Uh, we need to take some strong action. And there's, some, there's some very nice, uh, not only Time Magazine, but uh, also uh, uh, scientific papers that lay out the impacts of, of uh, over, over fishing. I don't have the slide here, but you can see some nice uh, uh, pictures of how the species distribution is changing uh, in the Atlantic and the Pacific. We're, we're seeing a lot more small fish, a lot more squid, a lot more plankton, a lot less of the, of the uh, bigger fish. It's definitely a change in the species distribution. So, we have this question, how can we anticipate the response to uh, future risks that we see? A lot, of, a lot of work has been done on this question of, of coastal, uh, coastal inundation when you have uh, storm surges and so on. One of the things we look at is not just the impact of, of the, uh, or the geographical impact, uh, but uh, how does it impact, impact various kinds of communities? In other words, where, where you have a poor community with weak infrastructure, the same sea level rise and coastal storms will have a much bigger impact than if you have a wealthy community that has the sea walls and the other pieces that you need. So as we think about risk and, and impacts for the ocean, one of the things we have to include is this combination that, as you can see down here, this combined inundation and social vulnerability, and that comes back to the communications question, because one of the things that we would like to make the case for is uh, how are we affecting populations around the country when we see these kinds of uh, changes in the ocean. Now, I mentioned uh, the fact that the oceans are uh, critical for forecasting. Uh, this is a seasonal forecast of uh, warm and cold anomalies. It's a six-month forecast, and if you look here, uh, you can see this is Europe right here, and you can see there is no anomaly, cold or warm, being forecast. This forecast was done without any ocean information. This forecast, which shows a cold anomaly, was done with full ocean information from this array of floats that currently exist in the ocean, the things called the Argo floats. And if I go back, Whoops, if I go back, it doesn't have it. And if I go forward, it does have it. You don't have the ocean, you don't get the cold forecast. You have the ocean, you get the right forecast. We have raised a lot of money with these two slides because it shows exactly what the impact is and why you have to have the, uh, the, the forecast there. One of the, things, one, of the, one of the industries that is very interested in this kind of forecasting is the soft drink industry because they have to know whether in a month it's going to be a little bit warmer than normal or a little bit colder, so they can know how many soft drinks they need to, uh, to stock. And uh, in order to make that decision, it comes right back to ocean information. So Coke is dependent on ocean information, and we've been trying to convince them that they should use some of the money that they make to support 
global ocean observations. So far, we haven't been successful, but I think that we may get there. Now, another, another point that you're probably familiar with is the fact that uh, a warm ocean makes a more intense hurricane. And this, this is a nice example. Uh, you look at uh, Bertain Katrina, for example, coming across Florida, it comes up here, comes across Florida. There, there it's, uh, it comes over this slightly warm water, gets more intense, and as it comes across the very warm anomaly in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, it, uh, it, it gets even more intense and it, it, it fades off a little bit, but still it was a very strong hurricane when it uh, hit. But it was this going over the uh, ocean anomaly, which is important. We had this ocean anomaly, this temperature measurement, because we had ocean observations. So that's another reason why it's important to have good ocean observations. This is a distribution of the uh, ocean platforms that we have uh, over the uh, world. Looks like a lot. But in fact, uh, it's a big world, and uh, we have about one observation every 300 kilometers. Uh, and so this is uh, not quite at what we would call the scales that we need to really make the kinds of accurate observations. We're doing this right. In some areas, we need almost 10 times as many observations as we have. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in Washington and in the capitals of the rest of the world with the UN system is to try to raise the money to make sure that we really have a full set of ocean observations. Now, I, I wanted to turn to uh, geoengineering just to give you a little sense of some of the things that have been proposed. Here's a, uh, here's a proposal for uh, wave-driven pumps that will pump cold water from the deeper ocean up to the, up to the surface to, ha to help cool the ocean. So uh, you, you have a, a pump here. This, these buoys go uh, up and down, floats go up and down. They drive the pump. It brings cold water up. And then that mixes with the warm water, and it helps to cool the ocean down. Could one make this on a large scale? I don't know. But these are the kinds of things that are being thought about. And if you, if you look at this, uh, you can see immediately this is going to have a, could have a significant impact on, on near-surface ecosystems. What is that impact? We don't really know. But as people start to think about these things, that's one thing we have to worry about. Another thing that's been proposed are giant misters. Uh, the uh, doubling, doubling of CO2 uh, uh, is about equal in, in the atmospheric effect to a, a change in clouds of about 1%. If you could change the cloud cover by about 1%, you would reflect the amount of heat, which is equal to the amount of heat that you would get from doubling CO2. So a lot of people have thought about, well, how can we increase the number of clouds? And one of those is, is to build giant misters that uh, suck up water from below and then use these uh, spiral sails that would spin around and, and uh, create mist that would then go up into the uh, atmosphere and, and cause clouds. Would this work? Well, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of studies done on it, a lot of uh, paper studies uh, that, that make it look kind of interesting. It'd be very expensive. Uh, and it would, uh, it, it would take uh, deploying these things. We don't really know what the impact would be. But once again, it's a scheme that people have talked about. Uh, and uh, it may well be that uh, we see these kinds of things as people start to worry about what, what are the impact. We don't know, though, uh, what would happen if you add lots of uh, mist. Would you really create more clouds? Would you change the heat balance in some way? Can you do it? I don't know. But I'm just saying there are things that are being proposed that could have an impact on our ocean and things we have to, have to really think about here. Uh, another thing is uh, this question of, of trying to get uh, ships moving uh, 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 across the ocean uh, with other, other forms of power besides uh, the uh, locally contained oil or coal or whatever they mostly oil these days. Uh, and uh, obviously, a ship like this uh, would uh, have two advantages. One is it doesn't put uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And then, Chris, it would be good for your guys because it's very quiet. Uh, but uh, you know, here's, here's, here's an idea. This, this is a model. Uh, uh, being, being looked at. Is, is this something that's going to happen? What's the impact? How could we be involved? Just another thing about uh, oceans and climate. Now, I, I mentioned uh, the, the question of ocean fertilization. Uh, obviously, we do lots of fertilization on land, and it's something that we simply live with because we have to do it to provide the number of crops that we have. Uh, there are areas in the ocean that are uh, nutrient poor, 
uh, that uh, only need a, a few trace elements in order to grow a lot more plankton. And in those areas, if you uh, added many of them, if you added iron, uh, if that's one of the elements that's missing, you can grow more plankton. And some small-scale experiments have shown that this actually works. You, you go out there, as they've done here, uh, you drop the iron filing, in this case it's in big buckets of rust iron oxide, and uh, uh, you come back later and you have, in fact, grown plankton. Well, if you grow more plankton, the plankton contains carbon because the photosynthesis takes in carbon, puts out oxygen, and then the plankton sinks. And uh, what the experiments are doing is showing that if you add the iron oxide, you get more plankton, and then they watch the plankton, the dead plankton, sink. They don't know if it's actually stored for a long time or if it moves to some other part of the ocean or what happens. Uh, but these are things which are being done today. Uh, companies are, are applying for permits. Uh, the International Dumping Convention has opposed this. Uh, so there's a, a battle going on between the companies who, who think this is a way of, of establishing uh, uptake of carbon, and if you can take up carbon, you can go in and you can have carbon credits for the amount that you took up, and then you can get credits for that, which can be on a carbon market, and you can, you can make some money. Uh, and especially if you did this in exclusive economic zones of developing countries, it might be a way of providing income for developing countries. So I don't think we've seen the end of this. Uh, uh, the, the, the companies are all struggling at this point, trying to, there's two or three of them that are trying to see if they can do it, but uh, I, I think uh, we're probably going to see more of this idea of fertilizing the ocean. Once again, we don't know enough about the ocean ecosystems to really say what the impact of large-scale fertilization is on those systems. We know something about what happens on land, but uh, the ocean ecosystems, really, it's, it's much more difficult. Another, another thing that is being proposed, and I pull this out of an energy department uh, uh, briefing, is to uh, take the... Uh, carbon dioxide that comes out of uh, uh, power plants and to simply pump it down into the ocean. So here's your power plants here, and then you simply take this and you pump it down into the ocean. Well, the, the, the picture gets kind of vague at that point because you don't really know what happens here. We know that if you pump CO2 into the ocean, it will go, if you pump it deep, it'll go down to the bottom and it'll sit there in a, in a layer. There's some wonderful films that you can see on the internet about this, but uh, we don't really know what happens after that uh, and how it affects uh, fish life and, and so on. You, you can actually see in some of these films, you can see the fish swim down through the heavy di carbon dioxide uh, saturated water and come back out again, but you, know, you don't really know what the impact is. My guess is we're going to see much more of this as, uh, as companies say we've got to do something about sequestering CO2. We'd probably put it on land, but we'd also like to put it in the ocean. So. What, what is the answer? I don't know, I'm just uh, making this point here. Uh, another thing that uh, can be done in, in terms of, of trying to grow carbon so that we're taking it up, and once again, using photosynthesis to take up carbon, is to build these artificial wetlands. Uh, you know, there are various ways you can, you can put this together with plastic mash, mesh and you can grow native grasses, and then the fish like it because it's a place where they can congregate and spawn. Uh, maybe large-scale artificial ecosystems will be built. Uh, good question about what, you know, what, what is it that's going to happen? How does this work? The reason I'm mentioning it is because I think these are things that are likely to happen and we need to really understand the impacts. So let's, let's, look, at the, uh, let's look at the Arctic uh, ice. This is something that uh, seems to be accelerating faster than the, than the models had predicted. As it gets warmer, we knew Science tells us that we would get uh, enhancement of warming in the polar regions. Uh, we see this particularly in the Arctic. And as we look at the long-term change, these are some of what the models are predicting. The uh, projected uh, sea ice extent goes down steadily. We've, we've seen it go down steadily. It's, it's kind of going up and down, but there's a trend that is, uh, that is heading down. And that's leading to this. Uh, Number one, the possibility of a uh, northern sea route across the uh, Arctic, uh, open ice sea route. It's 7,000 kilometers shorter to go from China to Europe if you go north of Russia than if you go down through the Suez Canal, 7,000 kilometers shorter. Well, every kilometer costs you something in a ship, so uh, this, is a, uh, this is a real change. 
I think Chris, you were pointing out to me that was 90% of commerce goes by ship. Uh, and so uh, when I was visiting the uh, Southampton Oceanographic Lab, which is in the southern part of England, they told me they were very concerned about the shipping port there. It's one of the major European shipping ports. Uh, because of the possibility of a northern sea route, the shippers would want a port in the north of England, not in the south. Uh, the Panama Canal is discussing now, in fact, they're actually actively building a, a broader canal. Is it going to be used? Or, in fact, we're going to see most of the transport uh, going through this uh, melted Arctic. We don't really know, but uh, we know that uh, there are ships doing this now. There are property speculators who, who have made millions of dollars buying land in Canada. These are the people who really believe the forecast. Uh, and went out and bought land in, in northern Canada at pennies per acre and now are selling it for thousands per acre uh, for the possibility of, of uh, warm water ports in the uh, Arctic. Well, it's not the only thing that's happening. Uh, this is a cartoon from The uh, Economist, and uh, you can see uh, this picture of the Soviet sub uh, Soviets, uh, I mean the Russians. The Russians uh, planted a flag on the... Uh, North Pole, as if to say they were claiming it somehow, forgetting the fact that we already have a Law of the Sea Convention. Of course, I know I'm in the US, and the US didn't sign the convention, but uh, everybody else signed the convention, including the Russians. And so uh, they planted a flag as if to start the whole process over again. It's like the Wild West with no laws. But we have the laws. And so uh, uh, how are we going to deal with this? Now it becomes much easier to go out and get resources from the Arctic, lots of mineral resources, oil drilling, all these things that are very difficult to do when there's an ice cover, become much easier. It's cold, but it's much easier to go out and uh, search for resources. You've got, now you've got to redraw the boundaries, which were already drawn, but they were drawn when people didn't think there was that much at stake. Now they have to go back and, and look and try to make it work. So the Russians have admitted that this is, this is correct, but uh, you, you can see from the cartoon, this, these are the kinds of issues that uh, arise uh, in a real world example. This is our planet getting warmer, and this is how society is changing. Uh, here's, here's my uh, cartoon on this. The bad news is the ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. The good news is if we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast. And so, you know, maybe the polar bears will survive. Well, here's, here's a, uh, another geoengineering idea that's, that's been proposed. Uh, the idea to uh, pump water up uh, during, during the winter and then to spray out uh, the frozen water as it, as it freezes when it comes up out onto the ice to uh, make more ice. Could, could this happen? I, I don't know. A lot of these, these ideas are kind of far-fetched. But when we look at the impact of climate and the, the huge impact of climate, I think some of these ideas are going to catch on, and there are going to be entrepreneurs who have made a lot of money in other areas wanting to try all of this. And it's our role, I think, as scientists to say, of the things that you do, some of these things might work, but you really have to consider all the ecological impacts of these ideas before we try to put them in place. Because in many cases, the technology that we put in place may be worse than the problem we were trying to solve in the first place. And we have plenty of examples of that. I mean, you know, in ecology, we try to put one kind of fish or plant or bug in a, in a certain area. And yeah, it solved the first problem, and then it created an even worse problem uh, that we didn't think about. Uh, so we have to find a way to. Uh, to accommodate this and, and understand what's happening. This, this is why I think it's a wonderful thing for students to think about, because these are the kinds of problems that, that are going to come up, real world practical problems that, that involve basic science and, 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 and what are the impacts. So uh, we really uh, we need to act now. Uh, if, if you look broadly, uh, this is the statement that comes out of the uh, Stern report on climate, Nicholas Stern from the uh, United Kingdom wrote a wonderful uh, economic analysis of the impacts of, of climate change. And this is his point. The actions that we take in the next 10 to 20 years will have a profound effect on the ocean climate and ecosystems in the second half of this century. And the benefits of strong early action outweigh the cost. The benefits outweigh the cost. That's, that's really the point. And in, in a way, it doesn't really, if you read this, if you read the economic literature, you know, it's discount rates. What, what do you think is the, the value of doing something now compared to the value of doing something in the, uh, in the future? But uh, 
the, the fact that we're going to have a very changed world if we don't do something about climate change means we really have to, uh, we really have to act now. And in order to act, we have to have public awareness of uh, what the issues are. And uh, to me, this, is, this means uh, we need to really work on our web-based information sources as, as much as we can. I mean, one of, one of the reasons that uh, the president-elect uh, is there is because he and his people all really understood how to use the internet. And I, and I think the internet is, uh, I mean, it's not the only reason but it's an important reason, uh, is, is an important thing for us. We have to be able to put out information about uh, the status, the trends, what are the risks. Uh, this has to be easily acceptable, accessible, it has to be up to date. Uh, we have to look at ways of collaborating. I, I think the whole uh, ideas of how Wiki works, uh, Wikipedia and all the things associated with that are, are uh, important in collaboration. Uh, we have to have Google and Google-like search. I've spent a fair amount of time talking to Google and looking at Google Ocean and trying to see how we can get all the data sets uh, there uh, into Google. Google will tell you, uh, we want to have all the data about the Earth and we want to make it accessible to everybody. And if you give them a KML data set, they'll put it up. But that's probably not enough. We really have to have, and they've told me this at Google, that they would like to do other things putting up other kinds of information, models and uh, forecasts, all the kinds of information, but they need to know how to do that, and they're interested in getting that kind of uh, input. I think we need collaboration among many institutions. We talked, uh, last night we were talking about collaborations between Cornell and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and I think there are other such things. And I, I mentioned uh, there about uh, the, the hurricane impact. It's not just the physical thing that we talk about, but it's uh, how does it affect different kinds of communities. Some communities are very vulnerable to change, some are not. Uh, one has to uh, engage the social scientists. So I would say uh, we have a good start, but uh, I would say the public has not yet really accepted the urgency of the risk uh, to society, and I think maybe trying to do some kind of stern report, the way that was done for climate, uh, it should be done for the oceans. Uh, our public attention is still focus focused on uh, near-term big disasters like tsunamis. Everybody knows what a tsunami is, a big Indian Ocean tsunami got a lot of attention. Uh, and so how does one get uh, the perception uh, changed of risk? So it's not just disasters, but it's also long-term change. So these are the things that we need, information, multimedia, and I'm a big uh, proponent of video games, all kinds of video games, and uh, you know, graphic novels, whatever we can use to get these uh, messages across, I think is, is important. Uh, this FAO, uh, the Food and Agriculture uh, Administration, has put out a game called uh, uh, Food Force. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it tells you about how you can uh, try to feed the world. Uh, uh, you know, it's not uh, as exciting as some of the big shoot 'em up games that you can get, but it, it has an idea. It's worth taking a look at. You think about how you could make that more interesting and exciting to uh, to young people. We we, we tried to put a, we tried to put the game together for National Geographic, which uh, was a little more exciting, called Storm the High Seas, and they're they're looking at it at the moment, where we talk about uh, how you try to manage a fisheries fleet, for example. Well, let me let me uh, conclude with. Uh, a uh, picture about sharks and a message about sharks. And I'm just going to, I think I had this minimized here. This is, I just have to go on the web here. Whether you've seen this or not. Take a look at this video. Take a look. This is a video of people on the beach, happy people on the beach enjoying the water, doing their thing. And if you could hear my computer, it's got the sounds of uh, people on the beach and so on. So a typical beach scene, happy people. All of a sudden, he looks out, sees something there. People, they start to see it. Hey, hey, what's happening? There's a whistle. The people, this is, this is bad, you can tell. Something horrible is happening. Something is coming in. Something is coming into the beach. Something horrible. And they look carefully, and what do they see? It's a toaster. 
Last year, 791 people were killed by defective toasters, four by sharks. So this is the public perception that we have today, not really focused on the right problems. How can we do some? How would you like to make a few more ads like that, which I think would be great? This is, this is on uh, SaveRCs.com, SaveRCs.com. But uh, anyway, you get, you get the idea. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to finish with that. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'd be happy to answer questions, or anybody has any questions. Yes, there's a question back there. It's, uh, I'm not really an expert in this. There may be people who are, are real experts in the, in the area, but it's definitely uh, one impact is, is, the change of the, is, it, is the change of the predators that exist and the, uh, and, the, and the ecosystem, so the loss of some of the predators. I think the other impact is, is changing temperature. Different temperatures will uh, lead to more jellyfish. I, I think it's also true that there's, there have been fluctuations of jellyfish over the years, and so one has to pull out the natural fluctuations from the, the ones that we see. But uh, you'd have to really talk to a jellyfish expert about that, because I, I think I've, I've seen some of the same things. I, I didn't mention, I, 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 Chris was uh, just showing me today, but you know, one, one of the uh, other things that is happening in the oceans, one of the, the impacts of, of society is increased noise, increased ambient noise in the ocean as shipping grows, the population grows, standards of living rise, we have more shipping in the world. The shipping, the noise from the ships raises the ambient noise in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the ocean and as a consequence the channels by which whales and marine mammals communicate start to get blocked by the noise which is already there. And so this is another uh, impact of society. It's not really an impact of climate, but it's an impact of, of society. And uh, one of the things that we need to do is to uh, understand how to do that. Now, he's done a lot of work in trying to get the shipping companies to agree to reduce their uh, noise level. But this is uh, yet another issue where, where we see an impact of, of society on the oceans. And uh, I, I think it's another reason that we try to get the public really engaged with this. Okay, and then down here. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, we have an expert on corals here. Drew is, Drew is an expert, and she, she can answer that. But I can say, tell you briefly, uh, the ocean warming is happening much more rapidly than we've had changes of temperature in the past. So the kinds of migrations that we've seen with corals or trees or some of the other ecosystems have happened uh, because the temperature changes have been relatively long in time. Now we do these rapid changes. We don't really know what the impact is. But uh, Drew, you may want to say something about that. Yeah. See, Bruce? Yeah, do you know of any sort of hopeful signs of international sort of agreements on reducing the overfishing problem? Like, is there, you know, it's been a problem for so long. Have you, have you heard of anything on the horizon? 
Well, most, most, of, the, most of the international agreements, uh, they're kind of depressing in, in terms of what they accomplish. But, th but there, have, there have been some uh, adoption uh, internationally of ideas about how to deal with, with fisheries. This idea of taking a fishery and, and, and setting a quota and dividing it up um, among the existing fishers and then uh, slowly reducing the total catch, not allowing new fishers in, into, the, uh, in, into the fisheries called the individual transferable quotas. Uh, has has worked pretty well in in a, in, a, in a few fisheries, and to the extent that that can be put in place, I, I think that's uh, that that has worked pretty well. The halibut fishery in in the United States was uh, was reduced down so that the fishery was only one day, and if it was a stormy day, you'd have uh, ships lost. Uh, but now it's a it's this transferable quota; you can go out any time as long as you don't exceed your quota. And uh, now that you fish all year round, and you get fresh fish. Uh, all year round. So that's, that's one that worked. A another one that has really worked, that the really the most successful thing in terms of fisheries, has been marine protected areas, completely protected areas. Uh, when, when you do that, the fish really do start to grow back. Sometimes it's not exactly the same kind of uh, ecosystem. Uh, and uh, as Chuck was pointing out to me, uh, if, uh, if the fishery dies and then the water gets colder, sometimes the fish won't come back, the same, the same kind of fish. But uh, the, uh, the marine protected areas, and, and this is an area, that's something that is growing, this idea is growing internationally, have been very, very effective in, uh, in allowing fisheries to grow back. And you can usually see where the marine protected areas are in, in the ocean by simply seeing where the fishing vessels are, because they're right around the edges. And that defines the area of the, uh, of the marine protected area. So to that extent, it works. Uh, most of our other fisheries agreements really haven't worked because uh, the players at the table, the, the fishermen and the governments, don't really want to have, uh, or don't really want to accept the fact that the quotas have to be much lower in order to be sustainable. We really have to have fewer fishermen with, that, with a given resource, and yet we're kind of increasing the amount uh, every year. And, uh, I, I think in the end, we end up with a lot of these species becoming commercially extinct. Not completely, but commercially. And uh, we end up with lots of uh, aquaculture and other things. That's, that's probably the direction we go, unless we could really get some understanding of the importance of reducing these quotas. But uh, to, read the, to read the literature and the books and so on, it's mostly a story of, of uh, over-exploitation. And that's why this book, The Unnatural History of the Seas, you go back and look at history, people have never been very good about uh, doing this. Yeah, Chris. Well, I, I think the, the most effective thing, uh, and NOAA is a scientific agency, lots of scientific expertise, and, and one thing that it does, it's a, it's a very credible agency because what it does is based on science. And I think the, the important role, something that NOAA does almost more than any other agency, is to educate the members of Congress about the issues that are critical. Uh, the, uh, you know, the budget in the United States is determined by the White House, the Office of Management and Budget, and then it's approved by Congress. But in fact, the smart agencies will try to work with Congress so that they have some balance against uh, the Office of Management budget. And, and it used to be said that the people from NOAA always stop at Capitol Hill before they go home at night because they're trying to make the case with Congress. But I think that's the place, is educating Congress because they're the people who are around for a long time and can really have an impact. And then to try to make a case with the elected officials, I mean the appointed officials who come in in the uh, executive branch about the importance of this. It's always a difficult thing to do, but uh, it's, a, it's an educational process based on the credibility of the agency. And, and I think uh, NOAA has done well on that. discretionary 
Well, I think it's a it's a step by step process. Uh, it, it is difficult, but we have every year we get more examples of why it's important to uh, deal with the ocean. Today, we have a much better observing system in the Indian Ocean because of the tsunami than we had before, and it was Germany that uh, provided much of the leadership in providing the money and the uh, staff members in, in order to really put a, a, a set of instruments around in the Indian Ocean, which we now have today. So that's something we didn't have before. We have it now. It was caused by a, an immediate disaster, uh, not a long-term problem, but, but we, really, uh, we really do have that. So that's, uh, that's one piece of it. Uh, this picture that I showed, the forecast with the floats and the forecast without the floats has been very effective in uh, convincing the governments, the U.S. and other governments, to continue the support of these floats, these Argo floats in the ocean. So as we have results that, that show a difference, and I've been, I really have been scouring the field to find, show me something that shows me with and without and why it was better with, and then I try to go get the funders to do something with that. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think we, we're, getting, we're getting more examples. But I think it also comes back to having a receptive set of people, and that's why I think education is, is so important. Because uh, when, I, when I first was head of NOAA and I went up to talk to people in Congress, they would say to me, uh, you know, I don't understand anything about your issues. I was elected to uh, create jobs and fix the military and fix health care and, and so on. Uh, and we would spend lots of time. I, mean, I had a, a new uh, representative from, from South Carolina, and uh, he said, uh, you know, environment is not important to me because I have these other problems. And we, we, we really made a nice case, I think, for, for coastal zone issues for South Carolina and why it was so important to really deal with these. And in the end, he was supportive of what we did. Uh, it was trying to focus in, understand the problems, and then work on it step by step. We don't have the advantage that the weather people have, that it's changing every day, and there are big storms and hurricanes that uh, are gonna get everybody's attention. Uh, so we have these longer term changes, uh, and so I think it's a question of, of really trying to get people to understand that in the environment, everything is connected to everything else, and so how can we understand that? So a person gets elected to Congress, and if I go say to him or this new elected you know, appointed person, says to this member of Congress, in the ocean, everything is connected to everything else, so you've got to be careful about what you do. And the person says, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that from school. Good point. Let's see if we can do something. I never got that response from a member, but you know, what I'm hoping is that someday we'll do it. And so when I left NOAA, that's why I, uh, ended up at the, I, I ended up as president of a natural history museum, because I thought I could learn a little bit about how kids are educated about the environment in natural history museums. Well, the first lesson you learn in a natural history museum is the kids come because of the dinosaurs. Okay, but how can you get them into other kinds of environmental issues? So that makes you uh, think about designing museum exhibits uh, that will really address this. So I think you know the informal education side uh, is very important. You have people here at Cornell uh, thinking about informal education. I was talking to Bruce Lewinstein today about the, the work he's doing with the National Academy of Sciences and informal education. Zoos, aquaria, natural history museums, these things that are not formal. And then formal education, like universities and uh, K through 12, this is another uh, important aspect. It's a, you know, it's a tough battle. You gotta, you gotta do it piece by piece. But I found, uh, you know, I was there at NOAA for eight years. I found that we, we made some progress on this. Uh, whether we can make it fast enough or not, I don't know. Fisheries is a particular problem, and these issues of uh, climate change, you know, we've got to do something about that uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, I, I think if we can get uh, groups interested, we're also working with industry. I mean, the, the uh, soft drink industry is, is one example. The utilities companies would really love to know whether it's going to be warmer or colder, because then they can prepare for delivery of energy. Uh, and, and so they're interested in doing this. Not to the point where they're really committed to help with funding, but they're interested in talking. So it's a, you know, it's a, it, you, you do it step by step. Yeah, let me get this person, and then I'll get back to you. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, carbon credit and, you know, pointing out that, you know, reducing the rate of deforestation, you know, will help, like, yeah. down the carbon dioxide. I mean, there's a, a lot of opportunity in kind of, uh, financial support for, you know, like, national park in tropical countries. But why don't we have something like this or, you know, promote more about the role of MPA in terms of, you know, mitigating climate change? 
the, the role of, of, uh, of protected areas. Yeah. But yeah. What are we protecting? Well, you know, there's a lot of push. There's a lot of push for this. There's a lot of good evidence about uh, how they are important. Uh, to me, I, I think if I were going into the government at this point, this would be one of my top priorities. And I've been urging the transition team and others to really think about this as a top priority for NOAA, is, is, to, try to, uh, is try to create more marine protected areas, because that's, uh, that's one thing in ocean management that we know really works. You're, you're right. Yeah, you had a question. I think this is a great idea, and I've actually talked to Craig Ventner about it because I was working with him on a DNA uh, barcoding uh, workshop where we talked about the species he was collecting. He's done some wonderfully interesting stuff in the ocean. But you're absolutely right, and this would be a great thing to do. Completely agree. Yeah. To think about ocean archivists putting back. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, piggybacking on on the uh, climate interest. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, oceans are a critical part of climate. We haven't really made that case as well as we should. I don't think the whole climate case has been made. And the, the point about star power is another uh, interesting way that that could be done. But I, I think it is there is an opportunity there. You know, it'd be nice to have a, an Al Gore type movie that uh, that talked about the ocean. And there are groups that, that, are, uh, that, are, that are looking at that. Some, sometimes these films tend to push over into the wonders of the ocean as opposed to the things that we need to do about it. And I think that's what was good about An Inconvenient Truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there are marine policy institutes, a number of... It would, it would make sense, because uh, at the University of Washington, we created a College of Ocean and Fishery Sciences, which had marine technology and all of the aspects of oceanography, as well as the policy and the fisheries. And it was very productive for the marine policy people. And so I, I think that's a, you know, an idea that can work. The what? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an example that worked, and I, I think it's something, you know, you have all the elements at Cornell, and that's a, the kind of thing, even if you didn't make a formal institute, bringing those people together, I think, makes a real difference. 